if we could, uh, what a lively group. What a lively group. This is what we love to see at the law school. So I get to say welcome to the Damon J. Keith Center for Civil Rights. Uh, and we're going to have a rolling series of introduction, which is exciting, but it shows really how close the national community is that does this work. Uh, and there's so much love in the room and people coming from across the country to participate in this program. Uh, and I'm getting started by introducing the first introducer, uh, who's Arthur Bryant, uh, Chair of Public Justice. And if you remember, Arthur was the inaugural Dean Robb Lecturer when we started this uh, series two years ago uh, to focus on getting people excited about social justice. Uh, Arthur, Chair of Public Justice. Uh, public Justice does everything under the sun relating to justice, from consumer rights to worker rights to civil rights and liberties, environmental protection, government accountability, toxic torts and mass tort litigation, uh, twice ranked by the National Law Journal as one of the top 100 influential lawyers, and Sports Illustrated top 150 lawyers uh, for the work that he's done in Title IX reshaping uh, what college sports is all about. Uh, so Arthur, take the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, Public Justice was very proud to create this series um, with the help and support of Pitt McGeehee, Palmer and Rivers. Um, and I get to introduce Karen McGeehee. Um, but I want to say before we do that, um, that this is an extraordinary event for me because you're going to hear from people who are heroes to me. Um, when I you heard I become the chairman of Public Justice, and for anybody who doesn't know, Public Justice is a national public interest law firm created by trial lawyers, supported now by over 2,500 of the top plaintiff's lawyers in the country. And the way we do our work is we work with them on cases. We use them as part of litigation teams to make a difference anywhere litigation can be done to make a difference. And the reason I said there are heroes in the room to me is we would not exist if it weren't for Dean Robb. Um, the way this whole organization started is that Ralph Nader went out and challenged the plaintiff's bar to create an organization to use their skills and resources on cases that would make a difference. And Dean was in the audience and got inspired. And when Dean gets inspired, you really just can't stop it. Um, and he was really more than any one person sort of the driving force to get us created. And I joined, to show you how old now I am, um, I joined as the sole staff attorney in 1984. Um, became the executive director in 1987. And an indication of how we're different is you read in all the papers about the lawyers who won the biggest verdict, the cases that made the biggest money. That's not what we care about. Uh, what we care about is doing good, making a difference. And so we created, when we were first started, an award called the Trial Lawyer of the Year Award. And it goes to the lawyer who won the case that made the biggest difference for the public interest in the past year. Money was not the issue. And my very first year as executive director in 1987, the trial lawyer of the year award winner was Morris Dees. Um, and he's been uh, a finalist several times since, um, possibly again this year, because he doesn't quit either. Um, and I will just uh, tell you, I, I try to share this with law students all the time. When I went to law school, I wanted to be a public interest lawyer. I said that in my application. Um, I was later told at Harvard Law School when I went in, 65% of the people who went in with me said they wanted to be public interest lawyers. And then I was told that five years out, less than 4% were doing anything you might consider public interest litigation. And I went to my 10th anniversary reunion, and I was stunned because I met all of these classmates who I was close with, I got to see them again, and they were making more money than they ever could have imagined, and they were miserable. They didn't like their jobs because they were making a lot of money to argue for things they don't believe in. And one of the reasons we have created this lecture series is to encourage all of you, don't do that. You can make an incredible difference in this world and have an incredible life if you spend your legal career arguing for things that you do believe in. And we hope you will take the example of this lecture series and of what um, Mars is going to tell you to take that in mind and follow through. Karen? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you, Arthur. My name is Kerry McGee, and I'm a partner with the law firm of Pitt McGee, Palmer Rivers. And uh, I am here today because um, we sponsor this event. We have the privilege and honor to sponsor this lecture series, um, and this is our third year. 
And we are so um, honored to do that, especially this year, um, with a civil rights icon like Morris Bees here to speak with us. And also during the week when we're celebrating the life and legacy of Viola Louisa. And I hope that you all have had an opportunity to participate in some of the events that happened here at Wayne State. Um, but I'm here to introduce somebody who I love very much, uh, the person whose name this lecture series is after, Dean Robb. And Dean and uh, his wife Cindy, of 30 years, who's also here tonight, are dear friends of mine. Um, although I just met Dean two years ago. Dean and I um, went on a freedom tour. Dean was 89 at the time. And we went on a two-week trip through the Michigan Coalition for Human Rights to the South with a bus full of high school students to educate them about the Civil Rights Movement. We went through um, Georgia, through Mississippi, Alabama. We even met with Morris Dees at the Southern Poverty Center. And it was a wonderful experience, and the best part of it was that I got to sit on the bus next to Dean the whole time and hear about his wonderful life story. Uh, Dean is truly a treasure. He uh, graduated here from Wayne State Law School. In 1963, he went down to the South with a group of attorneys to train attorneys in the South on how to defend victims of discrimination and racial violence. He's a founder and a partner of the first integrated law firm in the nation established here in Detroit. He also was a civil rights attorney who represented Viola Luizzo's family in a lawsuit against the FBI uh, because there was an FBI informant in the car who conspired with the Ku Klux Klan um, in her murder. He also is the founder and president of the Trial Lawyers for Public Justice, which is public justice now. And it's uh, really a, an honor. Dean has spent his entire life fighting uh, for people's rights. And he also um, happens to do a really mean imitation of Mark Twain. If you get him to do that. So not bad for a farm boy from southern Illinois. So please welcome me in introducing somebody who I consider the salt of the earth, a true independent thinker, Dean Robb. to say is we're we all need heroes um, and I've had a lot of them um, and the, the, you've met a couple of them already uh, Carrie certainly is one of them and her firm is one of them uh, her one of Michael Pitt and his wife Carol they have made um, public interest work an honor and this law school for me as a hero. We have, I think you're one of the luckiest bunch of students in America as far as law students are concerned, because you're in a law school that's committed to public interest service. And I, and to have this Keith Center adjoining the school with the great Damon Keith as your number one hero maybe. But pick your hero. I picked a lot of them um, over my career. I know that my son, Matt, who's in this great law school, I think I'm one of his heroes, which is nice. That's really nice. And uh, I don't know who you're going to pick. I'd love to be a hero for any of you. And uh, I'm happy to share my experiences. I guess the number one thing that I learned early on is um, to get out of your comfort zone. Every time you get a chance to do something that you haven't done before, or speak to a group that you don't know much about, or to introduce someone that you're not sure of, uh, say yes instead of no. Get out of your comfort zone. Every time you do that, you grow. And um, that's, my life has just been a series of those. I started out with that integrated law firm uh, in Detroit in 1950. And Detroit was an ugly 
segregated, racist town. Um, we've made a lot of progress on that, but back in 1950, we had to worry about where we could eat lunch in downtown Detroit. That's how bad it was. And the housing was segregated, and you know all the stories about the segregation. So that, we had to fight racism just to go to lunch in those early days. And so take that issue that is in your guts that really means something to you. And I suggest that the number one problem in America is racism and poverty. And that corrupts the whole thing, plus the drug war and imprisoning black people at an enormous high rate. But we've got a lot of great challenges, and you're the ones that are going to do it. And I'm so proud to introduce a, a guy that, my hero, Morris Deeds. This <laughs> son of the South, Montgomery County, he took us and drove us around to the cotton fields where he was a kid. Uh, grew up in a Jim Crow South. And out of that early exposure to all the horrors of the, the Old South, he grew. He, he first became a successful businessman, which is not a bad idea, because it's better to, you can fight a lot of more fights if you have money. <laughs> and he, um, he has a talent. He has made this organization, and you would, his, the money they took to build this organization not only came from about 300,000 American people like us, it also came from the treasuries of the Ku Klux Klan and the Southern hate groups, and he, he made hate and bigotry expensive, and if we can do that, uh, we got it. And this is the guy that knows how to do it. And you're going to have about 30 minutes. And he has, he's prepared to talk to law students because he knows that we're not going to be worth a damn if, if you don't pick up our, our satchels and carry them into the courthouses and raise hell for the little persons and the little people of America. Because they need us. There's plenty of need for lawyers out there. There's plenty of need. And you find that niche. Take that pro bono case. Go to the jails. That's the worst thing that uh, lawyers are not doing enough that get involved in the signed cases. They don't go to the jails and visit those fellows and those people facing, uh, facing the unknown. And every time I get a case, and I do a little still, I go to the jail, spend time, go through those terrible doors that sound like as they click behind you. And that, take that opportunity. Anyway, it's a great honor to introduce my pal. I love this guy. I just met him a few years ago. I've known of him for a long time. Morris Deeds from Montgomery, Alabama. Thanks, Dean. We owe a lot to this law school. Your dean is on our board of directors. But before that, she worked one year at the uh, Intelligence Project that tracks, tracks hate groups. And we also have a couple of our clerks here. Where are you now? Raise your hands. A couple of our clerks here that uh, maybe... Oh, there, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they met there, and I think they kind of got... I see a wedding ring on. <laughs> they, they didn't have that back in, uh, in Montgomery when... Did I take y'all to Red Schoolhouse, too? <laughs> okay. Okay, good. <laughs> how many law students in here? Perfect. And how many of you, when you uh, thought about uh, becoming an attorney, a uh, lawyer, thought that one day you might stand up in front of a court, a jury, or a city council, or a zoning board, or wherever, uh, to try to defend someone's rights? How many thought that maybe you'd have an opportunity, would like to do that? Kind of? Uh, I, don't, I don't disagree with Dean at all because uh, I think that that's important work to do, but I think also that lawyers who work for large corporate, corporate law firms are important too because uh, we receive an enormous amount of pro bono work from lawyers in these firms, and as, as Arthur knows, they, they certainly contribute a lot because you don't leave your conscience part 
on the first floor when you go up to those high offices to do your work for corporate America. Corporate America needs people who know that the bottom line of the people they make products for and not just the profit. Well, when Arthur started Trial Lawyers for Public Justice back in 1987, I was just getting my feet wet. I mean, I've been practicing law for 55 years, but uh, I started back in 1960. But I was getting tired of Montgomery, Alabama, and, and he had this organization in Washington, D.C. So I asked Arthur if he would give me a job with this bunch of young <coughs> lawyers who were setting up this organization, Trial Lawyers for Public Justice. He said, well, Morris, I, I'll consider that, but tell me, uh, you know, I need, I need some background information on you. And uh, he said, uh, where'd you go to law school? I said, University of Alabama. He kind of groaned. <laughs> he said, well, I thought that was a football school. <laughs> and, then, and then he said, well, did you, did you clerk for any, uh, any judges? I said, no, sir, I didn't clerk for any judges. I know, it, I know a few JPs, but I didn't clerk for any federal judges, nothing like that. He said, we got any, you got any, uh, was you on the law review? I said, no, I never got on the law review. But they had one in Alabama, but I wasn't sure, you know, that I'd qualify. And he said, well, you, would you have any writing samples you can send me? So I said, well, you know, you got any briefs you've written or memos or something like that? I said, not really. I said, but if I was sending you something, Arthur, because I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a salesman, you know, I'm a, I, I try to convince people of things, and I'm a trial lawyer. And, uh, I, I, I had a business, and in my business, we sold books. I had a book publishing company, and we sold books uh, all over the nation. At the time when books were sold by mail, and uh, they, uh, you know, you probably don't remember, but you had big brochures and big envelopes that came in trying to sell you a set of books on, uh, you know, uh, gardening or history, time life, had a lot of books. And I said, I'll send you a mailing package, Arthur, that I thought was one of my most difficult sales, difficult sales. And if you, uh, if you look at that, then I think maybe you decide whether you want to give me a job up there in Washington, D.C. So he, he, I sent it to him, and I said, now, Arthur, let me tell you, this, this, this project was a difficult project to sell, this set of books, because it involved uh, uh, selling a book on sex education in 1965. And, and, and for children. And, uh, and we sold these books for a large American corporation like, like uh, you know, uh, uh, World Book Encyclopedia. They had 20 million names of parents and they were all your kids and all that kind of stuff. And with Groyers and my way to read them, there's 30, 40 million names of parents and they needed product to sell. So I, had, I created the product and, and, and I would do a mailing package and then produce the books and they would sell them under their names. But this sex education was kind of difficult because in 1965, it was extremely controversial, to say the least. I mean, we didn't have ads on television where they advertised about the four-hour problem. I mean, you just didn't have that kind of ad back then. In fact, hardly nothing, but you didn't say nothing. And it was so controversial, religious groups were, you know, condemning schools teaching sex education. Because to teach sex education, that makes kids have sex, right? You know, that's what the preacher's all saying. So, you know, and then, and then some people saying that we ought to have sex education in school. But I figured, well, I could sell a set of, set of, set of, uh, set of books on sex education, multiple volume set, you know, that uh, the parent would give to their child and say, go, to it, go read these books. Don't ask me no questions. <laughs> so I, I knew, I thought the thing was really good. We, was, we, we were a big company. We had an office in Chicago. We had 250 employees. And it was a big operation. So this was, this was my dream project, you know. I mean, I thought this would really work. We, had, we did a space on aer aerospace encyclopedia. That sold really well. We did it with NASA and Smithsonian, you know, the first aerospace. We had a Bible story book. We just did a lot of sets of books, cookbooks and all that. So I had to think, well, what is going to be, how can I synthesize the theme of my set of books to make it sell? And I told Arthur, now, if I can do that, Arthur, I can try some cases for you guys, and, and we can you hire me up there. So I thought, well, okay, so what I wanted, what I wanted to do was to uh, come up with a theme that, that, that would be provocative enough to not be so controversial. So I decided I would get an uh, attractive young woman uh, dancing across a field of daisies. And the slogan that we came up with was face-to-face, with the birds and the bees. Arthur got this and he called me immediately and said, 
said, what's this got to do with law, man? I said, just listen, just listen. <laughs> I said, okay, so, and then, so, then on, and so then to get the jury interested here, the reader, uh, after that, so that's the back of the envelope, and the front of the envelope, what should parents do to educate their children about sex? Pretty good opening line for a jury, right? And, uh, and so naturally the letter on the inside, you know, said that some people think sex should go to school, some people shouldn't, but everybody knows it should be taught. And then we then presented our case to the jury. And uh, it was a, quite a successful set of books. It sold three million sets, it's $30 a set. So that's $90 million jury verdict here. And Arthur, Arthur, he, he scratched his head, you know, he said, you got to tell me more. Maybe you ought to stay in Alabama with this kind of stuff. <laughs> well, corporate America, corporate America is, is, is pretty savvy about selling things because they try to come up with, a, with a, a, a very simple slogan that says what they're selling. When you tell, and we all know that when we try to present our case to a jury or a judge or somebody, that it's a story about somebody's life or something that's happened to somebody. So you have to be able to tell that story. And most lawyers know that, and you know that also. I don't care whether you're talking to the Supreme Court of the United States or to the Justice of the Peace in Back Road, Mississippi, you still got to come up and tell the story. And, but you, and we know that, but synthesizing it down to just a, a key phrase that captures your story is really important. Well, you know, corporate America really understands that. Uh, we've. Uh, Harley Davidson, go oh, back up, let me back up because I like motorcycles. <laughs> American by birth, rebel by choice. I mean, doesn't that explain Harley Davidson? Anybody riding around in Buffalo sounding like that, my God, let him be a rebel. And, and they, I mean, that's, that's, I mean, they paid millions of dollars to come up with that slogan. And then, you know, Walmart, we, we know if you like Walmart or not, but they certainly have come up with a slogan that works. And then, we know that, was, that's, that came from the South. Finger licking good. I mean, when you see that, you're turning right into the Kentucky Fried Chicken for some chicken. And, uh, and you know, and, and as time changes, people have to come up with one word. That's uh, Hillary and Obama. <laughs> Had that put in. And, you know, and, and, you know, and that's like, it's when, the, when the moment is right, when the moment is right. Um, well, I promise you, had this product, Cialis, been invented before Nike came up with this slogan, Cialis would have had it. <laughs> right. Well, so I had, I had a case that was, and I'll tell you how I applied this to law. I never got around on it. They didn't hire me, so I had to go back to work. Now. <laughs> but, I, had, I had a case that was a, a difficult case. It was a case in the East Texas town of Linton, Texas. And, uh, a black man who was mentally challenged was invited out to a party in a field by a bunch of white guys and girls who were having fun in small town Texas and and, uh, and they didn't invite him there to hurt him or anything but he, he just was at the country store and he went to pick up some beer and they said come along Billy Ray come on down here with us and he's 42 years old and he loved music and all well they had a you know big old barn fire and the pickup trucks all backed up to the barn fire and about like midnight Everybody left, but except four or five guys and a couple of girls, and, and they, you know, they had other things in mind. They didn't want Billy Ray hanging around, so they just said, "Billy Ray, time for you to go." Well, he wasn't interested in anything but drinking a beer and you know playing his music and everything, so he wouldn't leave. And it was the deputy sheriff with him, so they just said, "Billy Ray, get out of here." And so the deputy sheriff slugged him in the cheek. Billy Ray fell backwards and had a serious brain concussion. Well, uh, Billy Ray, uh, they took him in, uh, out and uh, dumped him in a dump five miles from town. The hospital was three blocks away. But they put Billy Ray in a dump, and, and he fortunately was found by some hunters who came there early at daylight the next morning. He was uh, medevaced out and was taken to a hospital, but he uh, told permanently brain damage that he would uh, never leave the hospital. Well, and that's where he is today, you know, assisted living home. Well, they caught the four guys that did it pretty quick, and everybody knew they were out there, and these are the four guys that did it. And they had a trial in, 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 uh, in Linden, Texas, and uh, the jury found them guilty of a minor assault. And they got 30 days in jail 
and most of them are allowed to go home before the 30 days expire. And, you know, it, it, I had a chance to, to, uh, to, to interview the jury foreman in Linden, Texas, as to, as, as to why, in a criminal case, they didn't find these, guilt, these guys guilty of assault with intent to murder. And this is the interview, actually, was on uh, ABC News. In our opinion, News. we didn't think it was a hate crime. Because it was just, more or less, a bunch of good old boys getting drunk. And things got out of hand. John Reed was jury foreman in one of the two criminal trials. He says Billy Ray was somewhere he should not have been. He shouldn't have went. He should have been smart enough not to go. Well, so we, 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 we after that horrible miscarriage of justice, the New York Times got a hold of the thing, and they did a full-page story on it. And we were asked by the NAACP to come down and represent Billy Ray's family in a civil case. Uh, we were very unpopular when we got to town, I promise you, because Linden, Texas is a town that prides itself on being the music city of Texas. Uh, Scott Joplin was born there, and John Henley, who's the drummer for the Eagles, is from there. And, and also, uh, every year they had a music festival. And having the New York Times trash their town for being a racist town like this was bad. So the police chief, the sheriff's office, was against us. They wouldn't give us any evidence. And the uh, uh, newspaper was editorializing against us. Why were we down there stirring all this stuff up? So we filed the lawsuit, and uh, I tried to figure out, well, how can we humanize Billy Ray? We knew the story of this man who was a wonderful, everybody loved him in the community, but how could we humanize it so a jury would find for us and that that brings some justice in this area? Well, we, Billy Ray's family was very poor. They had no iPhones taking pictures and the only photograph we could find of Billy Ray was one picture of Billy Ray standing by a jukebox. And it was a little Polaroid, no bigger than four inches by four inches. And uh, after interviewing all the people who knew Billy Ray and the community and all, uh, I came up with a, with a theme for the trial. Billy Ray loves to dance. And he can dance no more. There's Billy Ray, as happy as he could be, with his, with his hand on that jukebox and those getting ready to get out there and dance. And he always he sang a lot. He just loved music. So I let that be the theme of the trial. And the, uh, uh, used that theme throughout the trial. Told his overall story, too, that he would be locked away, not going to get out in the street again, and medical problems he'd have, and a life care plan. But I put witness after witness on him, kind of spaced him in the trial to talk about Billy Ray's fun, the music and dancing and the love of that and how he would never get to do it again. In the opening statement, Dees came to represent Billy Ray Johnson, a mentally disabled man, in a civil suit that would put the town of Linden <coughs> to the test. I think every small town, if you, get, if you ever grew up in one, you got a Billy Ray. He came and sat on a courthouse bench, he had friends, and the Billy Ray loved to dance. If a man had a signature in this community, it was Billy Ray, standing by that jukebox with a big smile on his face, ready to do a dance. Now, Linden, Texas has another thing it's noted for. <clears throat> it's on Highway 59. <clears throat> Highway 59 runs between Interstate 20 and 30. It's four lane because so many trucks coming down 30 dip over on 59 to get to 20 to come on west. And so if you blinked hard, you'd miss Linden, Texas, but the little business they got from truckers and motels was because they was on Highway 59. And <clears throat> so uh, I, I, I always tried in, in, in cases to, to follow the, the teachings and the, the, what I learned from my mentor as a lawyer, Clarence Darrow. Clarence Darrow <clears throat> uh, had a closing argument that he made in almost every case and if you go read things about Clarence Darrow, the story of my life, his autobiography written in 1936, he it, it says the same closing argument. It doesn't change. The facts may change. He may represent a labor union organizer who was put in jail. He could have represented 
somebody who killed somebody, whatever it may be. You know his famous cases. Uh, but he had one thing, and that was to take the fact finders, jury, judge, whatever, and lift them above the simple facts of the case and give them an opportunity to make a ruling on something that will be important to them in their lives, will be important to their community and their country, something that stands for the justice system that we believe in and that their verdict will go down in the legal books of history. And so when I was giving my closing argument to the jury in this case, I wanted to make that jury feel like that it was important to rise above the petty racism in Linton, Texas, and to render a verdict for Billy Ray that would send a message and be important to them. The best way to send a message is to render a verdict that will be in the legal books of history. And it'll be like you putting a sign up down here on Highway 59 for everybody to see that justice does reign and rule in Cass County. Well, the jury <clears throat> rendered a verdict of $9 million dollars and the damages were about two and a half million dollars based on the life care plan. And I was really, really proud after the trial, the judge, wonderful judge, uh, said that the jury, this is cases on court TV and they had a pool camera in the courthouse, that's why you're getting all this stuff here at ABC, pretty well publicized case. And so uh, the jury said that they wanted to come out and speak to the news media, they want to make a statement. And I think the jury selection person that we used to help us, with pro bono, with, does big corporate work, she's very brilliant at picking juries, probably picked us the 12 fairest people you could find in Cass County, Texas. In fact, I had gone to every black church and there were only 20% blacks down there, and I, I actually went to every black church in a region to get that courtroom with some African Americans in it because I wanted the white jurors to see that they that they're ruling on things that deal with black people's lives and make them keep them honest, you know. Well, it turned out there was one African American woman on the jury, and I had some some black people help me. She said, "Morris, that woman is on the jury. She was at the church you spoke at last Sunday, and uh, you know she never said nothing to the jury and jury selection about it. So I would say, keep your mouth shut. <laughs> so, so so the jury came out, and uh, and this is and this is what one of the jurors said, which really made me feel like that we had gotten our point across. At one point, Mr. Hicks was testifying and he Hicks said the that Sheriff. they took it out and dumped it on the side of the road. You know, and, and that was just so offensive. I mean, this person is not a it. He's a human being. Well, I hope that we made a change in the community and not just with the verdict because the local paper that had been, the Texarkana Gazette, which covers this town, that had been editorializing about us and these out-of-state lawyers and representing the NAACP and all that coming to town, uh, wrote this editorial. Basically, justice comes to Linda. And let me read you the first paragraph. Many observed that justice was denied Billy Ray Johnson when the men responsible for his 2003 beating received light punishment for the crime that left Johnson severely injured and permanently disabled. The sentences seemed to send a message that Johnson's pain and suffering were somehow less important than the futures of the four white assailants, that a mentally retarded black man's health and dignity had little value. And it ended by saying the message the jury sent on Friday says loud and clear that Billy Ray Johnson matters. It's, it's so important when you choose a theme for your case that you really understand your case and you put it together so that, so that the jury gets it, but also it's an educational process for the community itself. We had another case that I'll close with that was a, a case that was difficult in determining how to get the jury to render a very large verdict. 
one that we knew that the plaintiff the defendants who were suing could not pay, they could pay something by that amount of money. But we want to send a, a message that that other people doing what these people are doing had to stop. You may remember back in the late 90s, early 2000, there were a lot of churches being burned around America, uh, primarily African-American churches. It was difficult to tell who was doing it. Most of them were racially motivated. Well, that was a church that was burned down in, down in uh, Clarendon County, South Carolina. And the FBI caught uh, two young Klansmen that had done this, and they got jail sentences. But I wanted to go after the Carolina Knights of the Ku Klux Klan, the organization that they, they were members of, who inspired them to do this. You know, suing an organization for the actors' members is not easy because the organization might say that, well, we're against abortions, but just because we preach that and teach that, that doesn't mean if somebody burns an abortion clinic, that, you, that we're going, the organization, right to life, is going to be held liable. And they shouldn't be. It's First Amendment rights. But we take it one step further. We try to show that the organization is motivated, inspired, uh, uh, in some kind of way lent substantial aid and assistance. And we've been successful with that over about a dozen cases in the country. So our goal in, in uh, Clarendon County, South Carolina, was to sue the Carolina Knights of the Klan, run by a, a guy named... Uh, I can't think of his name right this second, but he was he was the Imperial Wizard and they had a big headquarters and we wanted to take that headquarters away and put this bunch out of business. And so we, we filed a lawsuit for this fire. And one of the things that and trying to figure out how we could get a jury to render a verdict more than the hundred and forty thousand dollars that it took to replace this African American church that sat out in the tobacco fields, uh, I was to was to figure out how to make this thing much more important to the jury than just the burning of a church, if something could be more important than the burning of a church. Well, the minister of the church, and I talk with him a lot, and it's very important that you take the time to understand the people you represent. You know, you got to go in their houses and sit with them and drink coffee with them and see where, they, where their kids go to school. you got to really get involved so you can really understand it's not just a bunch of legalese when you come up with a legal theory and file a complaint. You got to really, really get involved with the people you represent to see what their loss is, what loss that they've suffered. Well, so I uh, met with this preacher. It turned out that this church was his daddy's church. His daddy helped build this church. And the Bible, the big Bible on the pulpit in this little church that probably had 70 to 80 members, uh, was his daddy's Bible. And so when that church burned, it burned that Bible. And when uh, uh, we went down, and, and I actually looked at the photographs that arson investigators had, they called the ATF and, and the FBI, I saw a photograph of, of what was the photograph of the Bible right there. And on the, uh, the page that happened to be, I'm not a super religious person, I grew up as a Southern Baptist, so I do know the Bible pretty well, but I kind of got, they kicked me out and I had to join the Unitarians <laughs> down in Alabama, you know. But, uh, but I, I did know Ecclesiastes, and I saw that page on that Bible looking at it, it said, a time for everything, a page out of Ecclesiastes. And I kept reading down that, you know, in that photograph, and I went and got the Bible, and I looked at it, and it says, one of the things is a time to hate and a time to love. So I picked the theme for this case, it's a time to love and a time to speak. Well, we investigated the case uh, pretty thoroughly. and uh, We had to show that this Klan leader had actually encouraged violence, and we had a lot of encourage, even arson, if we could. And so we were able to uh, get like 150 hours of newsreels. For, you know, thanks to the FBI, they were very helpful. Not the same FBI that he sued over there. But this <laughs> FBI we got today is darn helpful in many ways. I have to tell you, saved my life more than once. And they had collected up for this trial everything, you know, it had been in all the newsreels, because every time the Klan goes out, they got the cameras rolling. And so when they, you know, this Klan group took a bus of people up to Washington, D.C. to protest about our government. And, uh, and so it was like, 
40 Klansmen and like 3,000 anti-Klan people. So they had to protect the Klan up there. And so they were having a big rally going on up there, and all of a sudden they, they had to take these Klansmen away. And this guy was in, Horace King, he was, in, he was infuriated. He was so angry that they were, you know, these people were protesting and throwing rocks and bottles at him. And he said, he made a statement in that uh, uh, thing that uh, and if we had this down in South Carolina, we would burn them out. Woo! That was my, I mean, I investigated when he, he, we, he went blind looking through hundreds of hours and found that. So, it's scurvy, you know, you have to give the other side what you got, see. But naturally, I wasn't going to organize it and type it all out from. I put it in a big old sack and shook it up. <laughs> <laughs> this is it. Well, they never bothered, they never bothered to, uh, they never bothered to, uh, to look at all that, all that stuff, but they figured, you know. So when I, when I got this Horace King on the stand and talking about many things, I said, now, you have never encouraged burning anything, have you? Well, no, sir, Mr. B. And you never, you know, when you were angry at African Americans, you never said that you'd burn them out anywhere. No, I never did that. Not even in South Carolina, you wouldn't burn them out, would you? No, sir, I never said that. <laughs> well, please look at this tape right here, naturally. <laughs> The jury just frowned at him after that. Well, so when we got ready to do uh, the uh, uh, argument, I mean the case, I did something that I would encourage you to do, and that is really, really understand. That's the preacher of the church, and that was a little flyer stuck on a telephone pole near the church, because the Klan said that's where these black folks go to learn to get on welfare and, you know, get age-dependent mothers and all that stuff, rest of the vote and all. So, got to get rid of some of these churches. Well, he didn't say that for the public, but that, that's the preacher on the stand and, you know, talking about the church. And I actually got him to drive me from his house 20 miles away to where the church burned. And we talked about that morning when he went at daylight when he got a, church, got a call that his church was on fire. He didn't know how bad it was, but he saw how bad it was when he got there. And it was quite a tearful scene. He's shedding tears there talking about driving up there with his parishioners standing around looking at that fire and their, their beloved church was all in ashes. So in the closing argument to the case, getting back to the theme, the time to love, I decided that I would make a few statements and then I would let Horace King make my argument for me. I would take the exhibits that I used in the trial and I would make a little composite video of them and we would play those exhibits. And it started with the Klan rally, and if somebody bought them a good camera and tape recorder, they, had, they were proud of their rally, and so it had the music singing there, the old rugged cross, you know. So when we put this video together, we just let the song just keep right on going after the Klan rally. They went through the whole thing. We had a little church service right there in the courtroom. So this is the closing argument after I finished all <laughs> screen and uh, I got up to make my final remarks. I quoted a few things from it that said, there's a time for everything, a season for every activity under the heavens, a time to tear down and a time to build up, a time to love and a time to speak. 
And I asked the jury to speak up. Loud and clear. So that other people who would, in the name of hate and white supremacy and segregation, do this, they'd take note. Well, the jury went out to deliberate. The plan lawyer did his best to distinguish, you know, these groups from their teachings. He tried to claim the First Amendment and all that. Well, the jury came back, we asked, by the way, for $26 million. You know, that Bible had a lot of value. You know, and those cry robes had a lot of value. You know, and the church, you know, was gone and been real bad. But I said, $26 million to send this message. Well, the jury went out and came back with a verdict of $36 million. And the four-person jury walked by the council table, and we shook the hands and all. And uh, I said, now, sir, I'm just curious. We asked for $26 million. How come y'all came back with $36 million? He said, well, lawyer D's, that's what y'all wanted to give. We wanted to give something on our own. <laughs> <laughs> Well, anyway, I know time is running here, and y'all got other things to do, but uh, it, it's, it's important that, that uh, as Dean says, you, you try to get involved with uh, people whose rights are being violated in more ways than, than you can imagine today. Tonight, I'm going to make a talk, and we'll talk about what's going on today after Dr. Martin Luther King and his civil rights movement ended in 1968 with his death. So I hope you can come. We'll get into some of those things. But it is important to understand that human rights begin close to home. In our, in our schools, and in our workplaces, in our communities. And this is where people seek equal treatment and justice. And if they can't find it in these places, I promise you, we as a nation will look in vain for progress in a larger world. Thank you all. simple answer to your question. Um, we have a great group of lawyers working for us, and uh, if you read the New York Times recently, one lawyer recently, he's, he's with us, he went to uh, 
big law school. He runs our LBG2 project. He left the big law firm making $600,000 a year to come with us because of his passion. And he had, he had done a great job as a, as a corporate litigator. And he, I, as I left there, he, he flew, out, flew out of Montgomery with me. He's going somewhere. And he says, you know, the cases I've worked on have been on the, above the fold twice in the last week of the New York Times. It's kind of a premier place to have a case talked about. And he said, it's just amazing, you know, that I came to the law center and I got to work on these big cases. And I said, David, no, you're wrong. You made the case a big case. It wasn't a big case until you filed the lawsuit. One of them deal with conversion therapy. You know, give me 10 grand, I can take the case on and make them straight, you know. Well, that was a case that nobody ever filed a suit, and they got a hold of it and, and, and worked their way on the last three years up in New Jersey. And now the case has become a very significant case of the way they handled it. It was an enormous, uh, clearly God leave, a big corporate law firm got involved with it. And they helped us out. They paid all the expenses and put three lawyers on them on how they do something like that. And two of those lawyers have left them now and come with us full time. <laughs> so we've got two big corporate lawyers. So you may end up in a lot of places. But it doesn't mean tomorrow you can start out doing the Billy Ray case that I just described. I didn't start out doing that. I was, you know, I just uh, grew up in a cotton farm down in Alabama and just looking around. And people came to see me about something. One case became another case. Another thing you do is that, is that you can, even if you work uh, in a business law firm to pay some of the debts you have, then you can always do work on the side. We always try to get the people from the big law firm to help us out because they got influence in communities to go into. This uh, church burning case, we had a, a guy from a big law firm to help us, and, and everybody loved him in that town. And, uh, you know, he represented all the businesses, the insurance companies and all, but he, he came around, came work for us, and it just changed his whole life. I don't know exactly how to answer, but you can get, sometimes you can volunteer in a community, working with uh, things against aging, you know, you a lot of people taking advantage of old folks, you know, and, uh, and you've got so many issues in a community, uh, economic issues, title loan, debt issues, you just, you just have, you have to just go find your place to, to get involved, and it, it, it'd be nice, I mean, to, to come to work at Southern Poverty Law Center, uh, you know, and, uh, and, and I can, I can assure you, without a doubt, you know, Arthur didn't hire me when I tried to get a job up there. You know, <laughs> Jocelyn, you weren't in here. I just playing with Arthur. <laughs> but I, if, I, if I walked to the Southern Poverty Law Center today. He's much older than I am. So yeah. you know, if, if, I, if I walked to the Southern Poverty Law Center today, and I came up to my legal director, and I said that I'd like to apply for a job here, I would never get it. I wouldn't even be considered. Okay. And that's, that, to me, that's sad. Because I tell, I tell the people that I lost in it, just because you went to Harvard or Yale and all that good stuff and clerked for some judge and all that kind of, that's important. We need those kind of people too. But, uh, but Arthur went to Harvard, but he did. He took another route with trial of public justice. But you, you just can't overlook people that understand people. They, you know, they grew up on a dirt road somewhere. They can understand, uh, which I think most of you do you wouldn't, you know, be interested in this kind of work. So I don't have a simple answer to your question. I get that question all the time. You just got to, you kind of got to find your own way and, and find, you know, something, something in you makes you say what you just said. And you said you've been around other law schools and all that. Well, the one thing I, I think that there are hundreds of small towns all across America, particularly in Michigan, that don't have a lawyer. And uh, you... If you can't get a job in one of those big deals, you feel something for sure. I recommend trying that. Well, I've known a lot of guys do that, and a lot of women do that, and they open up their office, their neighborhood, cheap rent. Uh, no, do the you can all do your computer stuff now. You don't need a secretary. Uh, they got iPhones that do everything for you. You can open up in your bedroom. <laughs> well, you know, there's one thing that's important. We heard uh, a guy that helped uh, uh, Joe Kachet, who's going to speak next year. I heard him in a legal seminar recently saying that no matter where you are, there's a Quitam case around the corner from you. Quitam is when somebody cheats the government, whether it's through Medicaid, Medicare, nursing homes. Somebody's lying to get money from Uncle Sam. And, and, and those are very, very lucrative cases. So you can get a Quitam case, and uh, that law firm, get on the net, that law firm is specialized in it, but they exist all over America. It has so many, you know, things to do. Maybe, maybe somebody can write a good uh, 
you know, a lot of you all with no footnotes, just real simple. <laughs> but to answer your question. You know, our, our law firm, we're, I, I'm from the firm that Terry just spoke, Tiffany, uh, Peggy Jones. Hey. 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 Yeah, that's important. I just one last little small thing. Uh, we had a, a young woman uh, who worked in our office, um, and we had a, an immigrant justice project set up. It's one of our projects. It just got started, and she got a letter from some workers from India who were welders brought in to weld damaged oil rigs after Katrina. And they brought 500 of them in, promised them green cards, which you can't do. Anyway, so two of them wrote a letter after they'd been there a couple of months, and they'd been they paid thousands of dollars to recruiters in India, saying, "Please help us. We'd like to, you know, we'd like you to help solve this thing. We're twenty thousand in debt back home, and we're gonna send us home in ten months, so we'd be running to go back." So our, our young lawyer, like one of you, just wrote a letter saying to the company, "Would you please kind, of, would you please uh, get in touch with? We'd like to know what's going on with these people." Well, that that was seven years ago. And that case turned into a case that we got a $14 million verdict against Signal Corporation, representing just five of the Indians, and there's 495 left to go to trial, and this is a multi-million dollar corporation. And this young lawyer picked it up from our office, and it could have been a letter that could have gotten trashed, you know, but she stayed on top of it. And the first thing this company did after they got the letter, they called the five room together, says, somebody went to see a lawyer here, we're firing those two, a little retaliation, and one of them went and slit his wrist because he think I can't go back to India in disgrace. And then the others, they said, if any of you talk to these lawyers, we're going to get you. And we then discovered, we found an email they sent to all the executives saying, we'll show those liberal lawyers, not law firm, a little bit how to do business. We'll get our law firm on them. And a best defense is a good offense. So we'll go after that liberal law group for paying Montgomery. Well, a $14 million verdict came in last week. And I'm proud to say that that... Tyler Lawyers of Public Justice nominated that for one of the cases, you know, but it, uh, it's, and it, it's the largest verdict ever obtained by, for human trafficking that got them for RICO, for forced labor, for discrimination, everything you can imagine. It all came from just somebody picking up a letter and doing something with it. So, you know, you know big cases don't happen, big cases make. Yes, Carrie? In response to what you said on a practical level, what I'm going to say in terms of you have to distinguish yourself because it is hard to get a job. And I think that a lot of law school students are kind of myopic in their feeling that grades are the most important thing and they concentrate. I'm so glad to see so many of you here today hear, hear more so please talk. Because I think people get, students get too caught up in their grades and getting good grades. And I think probably the most important thing for you to do as a law student is to find a passion and to try to get a clerkship somewhere with a law firm and get in to that law firm, and maybe you don't make a lot of money, but you're working, you're establishing a reputation, you're a known quantity, you're getting to know people, network with people that have the same passion, and get active in associations and organizations that are consistent with your passion, so you get your name out there. I mean, that's how I got a job, because I went to work for uh, Dick Goodman, our product liability, uh, Attorney Well rep reputation, and, and I got involved with the National Lawyers Guild, the ACLU, and when I needed a job, people knew about me, and they also knew I was genuine about my passion. So you've got to distinguish yourself. You can't just come out and go, look, you got a 3.9. Yeah? Well, we don't know anything about you. I mean, that's nice, but I'm just saying, 
you've got to distinguish yourself and you've got to work. And I'm going to tell you, and I know Matt can speak to this, you work in a law firm and you learn a practical application of the law, it is way better than sitting around and studying for eight hours for civil procedure. Thank, thank you. Yeah. I would, would say two things. Let's thank Morris. Uh, but I have very some patience here. If you just want to tell us about the events going on with the guild tomorrow, because there's social justice issues that, that we're facing this week here in Detroit. Tomorrow, noon, Golden Ball by the undergraduate library. National day to shut it down. To say no more to this system giving a green light to killer cops. And I just want to say to you prominent voices for social justice that we need you to be out there tomorrow. And I want to say to your students, John Wilde heads up the National Lawyers Guild here in Detroit, Michigan, often start off a talk by saying the important changes happen in the street. It's what the people do in the street. And the people's lawyers role is to support that and back that up. And that's true. We need you to be out there tomorrow to back up uh, in doing this. But you're also a new generation of heroes. This is your fight. This, this slow genocide of black people turns into a fast genocide during your generation. You need to be the heroes that we have from the past generation and change all this and make sure this stops. Where are you? What's happening now? Golden Ball by the Undergraduate Library, noon. Flyers, everybody wanted. So one last round of applause. We've got Dean Rob, we've got Arthur Bryant, we've got Laura Keyes, we've got Karen Keyes, we've got Wonderful heroes for you. Thank you all for coming.